what the EMP does is to, if it's strong enough, and 100 kilovolts per meter would be strong enough, it fries all microelectronics. That means there will be no more computers. Your car is full of them. Uh, there will be no more electricity. Uh, the only person you can talk to is the person next to you, unless you happen to be a ham operator with a vacuum tube set, which is a million times less susceptible. The only way you can go anywhere is to walk, unless you happen to have a car that has a coil and, and condenser. Uh, and then you, of course, need to get some gasoline for your car. The Ready Life, into the country. Hi, I'm Lisa Meisner. And I'm Nick, her husband. <laughs> Welcome back to the Ready Life podcast, where you'll learn how to make your home and family as independent as possible for basic necessities like water, heat, food, and unfortunately, the power that most of us depend on these days. Today, we are talking about a question that we get quite often whenever we talk about off-grid power systems, and that's the question of EMPs. Which stands for electromagnetic pulse. That's in right. Case you're not familiar with it. <laughs> that's right. To, uh, I guess to kick this off, we, we wanted to play a little video clip of an interview that we had a while back with a United States congressman by the name of Roscoe Bartlett. And he's retired since, ne since then, but uh, he ended up serving 10 terms as a United States representative from the state of Maryland. And he was the ranking member on the House Armed Services Committee, one of three scientists in the Congress. And he was the authority in Congress on EMP, on electromagnetic mm -hmm. pulse. And he was one of the major forces to bring this issue to the light of day and to make as much progress in America as we've made today in um, you know, in preparing for this kind of an occurrence, and um, we still have a long ways to go, though. And he was a, a champion of that. So we wanted to play this little video clip as an introduction, and then we're going to get into some nitty gritty of what exactly EMP is, and how it can affect you, and also how it can affect a off grid power system, and um, any tips that we might have. So here's yeah. the clip of Congressman Roscoe Bartlett. People in cities are very, very tightly packed together. Where you have that many people, just the odds that there will be a bad apple or two in a barrel, that the number of those go up because of all the people that are there. And I just think that the rational people in looking at the situation in the world today would realize that, um, uh, that they would be better off, they and their families would be better off if they uh, were more self-sufficient, if they were outside the city. And by the way, there are other things that could uh, bring on this, this crisis other than, than oil. Uh, there is a phenomenon uh, very well known to uh, people who uh, plan wars and build weapons that the average citizen may not know about, and that is uh, called uh, EMP. Uh, and this is uh, electromagnetic pulse. It's produced in various ways. Uh, but the most uh, uh, widespread pulse would be produced by a nuclear weapon detonated above the atmosphere. Our country has only one experience with that. This was in 1962, I believe it was, over Johnston Island, and we had an extra atmospheric burst. The weapon was detonated above the atmosphere, and uh, this produced a surprising consequence. There was a huge flow of what today are called Compton electrons, and it was like a a huge solar flare, orders of magnitude stronger than a solar flare, like really strong static electricity everywhere all at once. Another way of thinking about it is like a uh, lightning strike everywhere. Uh, the Russian generals tell us that the Soviets, and I can quote this because this is in the public domain, it's not classified, uh, tell us that the Soviets had developed an EMP weapon that produced uh, 200 kilovolts per meter at the center, a weapon detonated 300 miles high above the United States uh, would reach a line of sight, the margins of our country, uh, Florida and uh, uh, Northwest Washington. And this would produce at the margins about um, 100 kilovolts per meter. Uh, if that's true, that is considerably more, I think, than anything that we uh, designed and tested to 
during the Cold War when everybody was concerned about EMP. By the way, almost any country that has nuclear weapons in any war game, an EMP laydown is an early occurrence in that war game. And when the referee is there monitoring the war game, they just take their hand and wipe most of the assets off the table. Because what the EMP does is to, if it's strong enough, and 100 kilovolts per meter would be strong enough, it fries all microelectronics. That means there will be no more computers. Your car is full of them. Uh, there will be no more electricity. Uh, the only person you can talk to is the person next to you, unless you happen to be a ham operator with a vacuum tube set, which is a million times less susceptible. The only way you can go anywhere is to walk, unless you happen to have a car that has a coil and, and condenser. Uh, and then you, of course, need to get some gasoline for your car. This would be a horrendous kind of, of an experience. Uh, I sponsored legislation about six years ago that set up an EMP commission. I'm sure if you do a Google search, you can find this. It's the EMP commission, unlike most commissions that work for a year or two and are then retired, the EMP commission is still working because this is very serious. Our Pentagon is looking at all of their weapons systems. By the way, our military is very concerned about the power grid. And they are looking at what's called islanding because they get much of their power from the private sector. Now they like a hospital, they have some generators and some diesel, but that's only gonna run for a little while. Then what do you do when that runs out? Because the grid could go down and stay down for a very long time. It is kind of on the edge, on the margin. And you may have noticed that when there is a tiny problem in one place that can really cascade and bring the power down as it did in Florida not very long ago over a very wide area when several million people are out of electricity for a number of hours. So there are a number of events that could create a situation in the cities where civil unrest would be a very high probability. And I think that those who can and those who understand need to take advantage of the opportunity when these winds of strife are not blowing to move their families out. I'll tell you something else about this. It's just plain fun. When you're looking at the challenge of what do I have to do so that I'm independent of the system? And you need to know that in our large cities, there's about three days supply of food. Now those supermarket shelves may look really full and they are because when you're taking it off, the clerks are stocking the shelves. And if they didn't stock the shelves just at the rate that you take it off without a panic, all those shelves will be empty in about three days because the trucks need to keep running to keep those shelves full. What if the trucks didn't run? There are a number of things that could, could bring about situations where there could be really serious uh, civil unrest in the cities. So I think that provident people who understand, who have a responsibility to their families, will be, will be looking more and more to getting out of the cities. And it's a huge challenge. There is no exhilaration like the exhilaration of meeting and overcoming a big challenge. If you stop and think about, gee, what do I need to do so that I can be independent out there? That, 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 that if the world fell apart, it really wouldn't matter for me and my family. That's really an interesting challenge. By the way, uh, one other reason for doing this is it's a really patriotic thing to do because for all of our citizens who aren't dependent on the state when an emergency happens, we're gonna be stronger and stronger, aren't we? So as a member of Congress, I'm concerned. I would like everybody to do this. I would like everybody to have a year's supply of food. I'd like everybody uh, to, to have some plans so that they can make do if, if any one of these emergencies occurs. But it's gonna be easier to do that. And you'll avoid the problems of civil unrest if you're out of the cities and out in the country. Wow, that's really sobering, isn't it? It is, really. You know, it's interesting to think that this congressman actually has an off-grid homestead that he set up. Yeah. He uh, was very much concerned about this issue and the, the impact that it could have. But we wanted to get into a little more of the granular details of, of what exactly an EMP is, because he was referencing what it would do. But let's spend just a, a quick minute on, on what it actually is. Mm -hmm. It's a electromagnetic pulse is a, a short burst of electromagnetic energy that can happen uh, a variety of ways. And, and Congressman Bartley talked about this. It can happen from a solar storm, like solar activity, you know, sunspots, various mm -hmm. forms of solar activity. It can also, the, probably the most powerful and devastating way it could happen is from a 
nuclear weapon detonated above the atmosphere. And, uh, and there may be other types of, of weapons as well that can create EMPs. But a nuclear EMP, one reason it's so devastating is that it contains all of the three types of energy, you might say, that, that can um, cause a EMP. There's E1, E2, and E3. And I know this sounds kind of technical, but, <laughs> but um, bear with us for just a minute because an, an E1 is going to be e, e1 is going to come about from a nuclear emp as a general rule it's a mm -hmm. quick high voltage burst it peaks in as little as five nanoseconds wow now that is incredibly fast it's it's impossible to comprehend how quick that is but it's super short duration high energy and it's probably the most likely to damage your electronics or the components of your solar system mm -hmm. happens so fast that even lightning arresters are typically not able to clamp down fast enough to protect your equipment. For instance, one of the best lightning arresters on the market for off-grid solar equipment is the Midnight Solar SPD. And uh, SPD stands for Surge Protection Device. Uh -huh. And it's really good, way better than the old Delta lightning arresters. <laughs> and it can clamp down in as little as 15 nanoseconds, but which is fantastic for lightning, but that's not good enough for E1 from a EMP. And um, so anyhow, that's, that's, the, that's one of the reasons why a nuclear EMP would be so devastating is because it's so quick, so fast hits you know so before powerful. equipment can clamp down there are some uh, i've seen at least one device out there that claims that it can clamp down fast enough to stop an emp whether that's true or not it's hard to it's hard to verify you know you can see people running tests in their laboratory or in their room or whatever <laughs> but these are all staged tests they're not the real deal and so you know, I take yeah. it with a grain of salt when I see people running tests for something uh, really impactful like that in the back room of their house kind of thing. So what about an E2? So E2 is similar to a lightning strike with moderate duration, um, you know, maximum of like one second or so. So we're not talking those minuscule amounts of time from the E1. <laughs> So as far as the duration, at least one second or so maximum, moderate amount of energy. And it's probably the easiest type of, of the three of these. It's probably the easiest type to protect against since most systems, most homes, most even off-grid systems that are set up properly have some sort of lightning protection, surge protection devices, these kinds of things installed. And they're designed for this range. They're designed mm -hmm. for nearby lightning strikes, not a direct hit. I mean, nothing's going to stop a direct <laughs> hit, but yes. as far as nearby lightning strikes, they're designed for dealing with that. So um, the, the main difficulty though with E2 could be in the fact that you've already had E1 hit and potentially wiped out your any protection devices that you already had set up. And then the E2 comes along and it's got potentially a free access. Yeah, free pass. Free pass, right. So um, even this one isn't a sure shot, but if your lightning arrestor surge protection device equipment survived the E1 or if there wasn't E1, then you know you might be okay with the E2 potentially. Yes. And then, so then the last one, E3. Yeah, E3 is a really interesting type it's very similar to solar geomagnetic storm. In fact, this is the type of energy or whatever you want to call it that would come from a solar storm when you, when you have solar activity like this. And it's lower energy, but it's much longer duration, up to hundreds of seconds. So wow. minutes can last minutes long. And E3 is the most likely to affect the power grid and anything else that has a long length of wire because 
that wire acts as an antenna that really picks up the E3. Conducts and, it. Yeah, it conducts it. And, um, you know, E3 can last for a couple of minutes, like we were saying. And my understanding is that the bulk of the expected damage from E3 would be from overheating and damaging transformers in the grid mm. and things like this. So it's really, really impacting the grid. And like I said, anything with long lines. Um, some of these transformers, like Congressman Bartlett said, they can take months to replace because they're custom ordered from overseas. Yeah, and if you've got one of those big ones blow out, then you've got a whole section of the countryside that doesn't have power, yeah. which could be devastating. And, you know, I'm sure that, that we could handle a few of those, but if you have mm -hmm. a bunch of those go out at the same time, what do you do? What yeah. do you do? And unlike mm -hmm. a nuclear EMP, an EMP that's caused by a solar or geomagnetic storm only consists of the E3 component. Nuclear EMPs have all three, once again. Oh, that's which right, yeah. is one reason that they're so destructive. Hmm, wow. So um, with, with an EMP, how large of an area could be impacted by like a nuclear EMP or... Right. A solar EMP. Well, it depends on a number of factors, but one of those is the source of the EMP. You know, is it f coming from space weather, from solar mm. activity, or is it coming from a nuclear EMP detonated in the atmosphere, this kind of thing? Yeah. So another factor is the amount of power that the EMP is conveying. And that is the unit of measurement that's used for that is kilovolts per meter. And so EMPs are line of sight. And mm -hmm. so the further up it gets, the more area it could potentially cover, but it also has to have enough energy to where it could actually do damage at its further furthest hmm. line of sight, you know, that the radius around it as you go up enough, if you go up enough miles into the, the atmosphere and above the atmosphere, you can get to where the, there's a point at which you could even cover pretty much all of the continental United States. Hmm. But it's only going to damage that entire area if it's strong enough to have damaging energy at its outer reaches. Yeah. So that is a factor also how strong it is. And, um, you know, like I was mentioning, the altitude at which it happens, the higher the altitude, the the wider the the diameter of its reach. And but then the less destructive it is, the further away from the center. It's not going to be as strong, you know, as yeah. it's further up and further hmm. out. And uh, and then other factors like the current condition of the Earth's magnetic field and, and things like this. Hmm. But um, typically you hear of the risk from a nuclear EMP as being extra atmospheric or detonated above the atmosphere. Uh, but it is possible for an EMP, for a you know a nuclear EMP to be detonated at lower altitudes, and this would affect a smaller area. But mm -hmm. it would also include significantly worse damage in that local area from you know just the blast itself and the radiation yeah. and and all these kinds of factors. Um, but hmm. uh, you know, bear in mind that since an EMP is line of sight. If you have a mountain in between you and where mm. it was located, if you're right up against a mountain and the EMP is detonated somewhere where the mountain Down is between below, you, yeah. that is going to significantly help you and could potentially shield you from it, um, hmm. at least right there locally. Yes, there's still going to be overall effects in the area surrounding you and the general area, but it is possible that your specific location could be spared if you were in the shadow of a mountain. Hmm. You know, that's interesting. While you were talking, I was, I was just thinking about how, how, um, how much it would affect our society hmm. if, you know, if an EMP yeah. happened. Like the sorts of things that it would affect would be, you know, would be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, depending on how high it was or how close it was, or if you were shit, you know, 
Yeah. I guess, you know, it just would depend greatly on where you were at, but it could dramatically alter, like, <laughs> life as we know it. Oh, it could be the most devastating thing that anyone could do to us in the modern society. Which is why Congressman Bartlett was so concerned about yeah. this particular subject. Right, right. So. Yeah, you know, how would it affect? Um, we don't really know for sure the full impact of an EMP mm -hmm. on our civilization because there are so many variables and yeah. um, all of this. Uh, some have surmised that in a EMP, all modern cars would instantly stop running, airplanes would fall out <laughs> of the sky, and Oof. anything with a micro trip would be toast. Now, I don't know. You know, that's what some have surmised. Mm -hmm. uh, various small scale automobile tests have occurred, but in the most well known test that I'm aware of, the budget didn't even allow for testing the cars to the point where they were damaged. Mm -hmm. And so that's this is one reason I'm I'm really skeptical of these little tests that people will do, or somebody comes out with a device and they say, This will protect you from an EMP, <laughs> and then they set up some kind of a thing that's supposed to simulate an EMP and they put a phone in there and the phone comes out okay and they say, okay, this proves that my yeah. device will protect your electronics. And it's like, I don't buy it necessarily. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But the, the trouble is that we have not experienced a large scale powerful EMP mm -hmm. since we have come into the electronic age. There have been some large-scale strong EMPs in the past, but they were before we were in the electronic age. And so hmm. we, we really don't know firsthand in real-life conditions what would happen. And, you know... But, you know, the thing is, I was just thinking while you were talking about the cars getting damaged and whatnot, like even if the cars didn't get damaged and it was just the power grid that went down... I mean, think about it. Like, okay, you can drive your car into town, but what's in town that you would be getting? You can pull yep. up to the gas station and, you know, um, well, it takes electricity for, you know, the pumps to work these days. And so it's like you wouldn't be able to get gas, really. Or if the internet um, is disrupted, almost oh, everything. Oh, yes, that's so true. Almost everything depends upon the internet for the ability to buy anything with your credit card, card mm -hmm. for the ability of almost anything to work. I mean, just think about all the things that you control with an app on your phone and all yeah. the things that... So true. It, it, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. I think you could go deeper and deeper and deeper and you would be absolutely blown away at how much is dependent upon so many critical pieces of infrastructure. That's so true. That's so true. Yeah. So yeah, you you trace the 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 trail of dependence, you know. So you've it keeps going your and car, going. Your car, you know, you try and get gas for your car. Are the roads blocked with other cars that were damaged or ran out of fuel because they couldn't get fuel at the gas station, or you know, you go to buy groceries and you don't expect to be even... buying groceries if there's any left. Yeah, um, because of the whole buying situation, and you know the cash registers and lights in the grocery store, and and all of these things, and really don't expect to be buying much of anything, and um, you know that's hmm. assuming once again that you can actually get around. So, so how can you protect your stuff from an EMP? Because that's one question we get a lot. Like, yeah. okay, so I have a solar power system. How you know can I get some kind of equipment to protect my solar system from getting damaged from an e either a solar or you know a nuclear EMP attack or something like that. Yeah, there there are there is a little bit of equipment out there like that and to be honest, I'm kind of skeptical and you know, if you want to try it, you can. I'm not to the point where I'm ready to recommend it. <laughs> I it, I don't know that it's necessarily going to hurt anything, but I think that you're asking for trouble if you get some gadget and stick it in your breaker panel in your or you know what wherever it is that they uh, want you to wire it in mm. and think that this is just going to magically save everything in your house. I just I think that's unrealistic. I really do. 
and there's just too many variables that we don't know about. And so my here's my take on it. Um, my take on the whole EMP thing is you do the very best you can with doing a really good job with lightning arresters, surge protectors, that kind of thing. Um, go overkill on that, you know, like multiple ground rods and a triangle tied together, really good surge protection devices. Like I like the Midnight Solar SPDs and put those every place that it's logical to put, like out on your solar array um, before the charge controller um, so that you've got one on either line, either side of the line that connects your solar array to your charge controller and then one on the output of your inverter because all of those wires running throughout your house are going to act as an antenna mm, and they're going to back feed into your inverter and potentially fry your inverter. Hmm. So anywhere, just think of anywhere where there's a length of electrical wire that could act as an antenna and surge protection devices or lightning arresters there. Things like this, do the best you can with that. And then at the end of the day, realize that that may not be good enough. You know, maybe if you're on the outer edges of it, mm -hmm. where it's the power of the EMP is diminished, maybe it will be good enough. Maybe it won't. We don't know. But as your backup, the one thing that I do feel pretty confident about is if you get a inexpensive spare piece of equipment for each of the key components that might be knocked out, like your inverter, your charge controller, these mm. kinds of pieces of equipment. Get an inexpensive model. doesn't cost a lot. You can pick these up. They're made in China all day long. <laughs> and I, I'm usually recommending folks to not get them because I, I don't like that being your primary equipment. And if you can afford to get a good quality one as your backup, that's yeah. great. But if you can't, then just get an inexpensive backup, inverter, charge controller, things like that. Stick it in a metal trash can or a metal container with uh, aluminum tape around the lid and put it in, a, in your shop or some kind of a metal building or whatever. Whatever you can do to protect it, but just the very fact that it's not going to be hooked up to wires gonna is going to protect, yeah, make diminish the chances of it being dim damaged uh, dramatically. And in my mind, that's really the only EMP protection that I feel confident is for sure going to work. Hmm. Everything else is just guessing and people's simulations and, and all of this. Hmm. So that would be my advice. Uh, try the gimmicks if you want, but at the end of the day, get your, do really good um, lightning arrestor, surge protection, and get yourself some spares and stash it away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while I, I do believe that it's a, a great idea to prepare for an EMP, the bigger issue really is getting your family into a more self-reliant lifestyle that doesn't yeah. depend upon the system. Because just think about this. Say you protect everything on your homestead and everything is working perfectly on your homestead. But if you're still dependent upon the outside world for critical pieces of, you know, critical basic necessities of life, mm -hmm. then you're in a, in a world of hurt. You know, you're in big trouble even mm -hmm. still. So yes, try and protect your equipment as best you can. But the best thing you can do is to become as independent, self-sufficient as possible so that you aren't dependent upon the power grid and these other entity outside entities for basic necessities mm -hmm. like being able to get water out of your well or being able to keep your home warm or being able to eat or things like this you know that makes me think of something you say all the time and that's that you like to build redundancy in mm -hmm. everything so like even if you are off the grid and you have a well like put a hand pump on it that's right because you're relying upon an electric pump that even if we're not talking about an emp Something could happen and the, the pump could malfunction and all of a sudden you're without water that's <laughs> and right. that's something that you can't live without. And so, you know, having redundancy on on the critical infrastructure, especially your basic necessities, is really a brilliant idea. Yeah. Think of this as insurance. You know, insurance is something that we pay money for hoping that we never need to yeah. use. That's right. And that's what this kind of thing 
is like the hand pump, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. think of that as insurance. And um, yeah, the the other stuff though, you know, I, I think it's great to as much as possible incorporate independent lifestyle into your everyday lifestyle though. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are certain things like that, that it's, um, you know, you just chalk it up as insurance and hope you never need it. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So um, you mentioned a couple of the components of a solar system or solar power system that might be impacted. Um, what what are like the, the key components that are most vulnerable to an EMP? So like I mentioned, the charge controller, I consider that like the probably the most vulnerable because you've got this large solar array that's acting as an antenna and it's connected to long potentially long wires mm -hmm. running into the charge controller and so that's just asking for Trouble. picking up yeah picking up <laughs> a lot of current so charge controller i think is vulnerable the inverter like i mentioned earlier it could be backfed from wires running all through your house you've got hmm. hundreds of feet of wire running through your house running back to the breaker box and then back into your system eventually to your inverter yeah. and so i think that that's a vulnerable piece of equipment and if you have lithium batteries they have an onboard electronic battery management system i think that's vulnerable as well because it's tied in to all of this so when that current comes coming in from the solar array it's going to dump into the battery system too potentially if if you if it's not shunted off somewhere. Hmm. What about and the solar panels? You mentioned that they act like an antenna. Would those be affected? So that's one that I have a question mark about. I don't think that the solar panels themselves are going to be damaged. There are mm -hmm. some diodes in the solar panels that maybe they might be, but you can actually replace those. You can get spares for hmm. solar panels and spare diodes for the solar panels and at least on on a lot of them you can replace them if you had to and uh, or if they got fried um, you know do some other measures I'm not going to get into the too much technical stuff here but mm -hmm. um, there are options there but I'm, I'm not really as concerned about the solar panels themselves mm. and uh, and then if you of course if you had like a fuel powered backup generator mm. A lot of those these days have electronics on board and they could be hooked up to a lengthy wire connecting the generator to the house because most people don't That's like true. having the generator right next to their house. Mm -hmm. And so that could potentially be vulnerable as well. And um, so any of these that you can have a backup for and stash it in as uh, protected as an, of an environment as you can, that's great. If you've got a basement, uh, root cellar, something like that, stick it in a metal can, put it down there, get as much matter as you can between it and the sky. Hmm. And that's going to be a real help. But at the end of the day, just remember your basic necessities, water, heat, food, things like this, and think through what it would take for you to be able to get these items that your family must have without being dependent upon huge corporations, government entities, other outside or, entities like or this. Or man-made equipment, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if necessary. Right. Yeah, as much as possible. <clears throat> it's, you're never going to get entirely away from man-made equipment. But yeah, as much as possible. So kind of back to basics sort of thing. And I know there's probably going to be a ton of comments on here <laughs> of folks saying, oh, you must not know about this EMP protection thing or that or the next thing. There's a variety of... of devices out there but <laughs> i still unending. say this is my just after years of looking into this this is to me the most common sense thing the most common sense strategy makes sense to me and i feel like it's the most secure and and just the most logical way to deal yep. with this sometimes it's just better to keep it simple yep <laughs> so EMP, we hope it never happens. That's right. We, re we hope and pray. We pray for the best and prepare for the worst. And I'm not losing sleep over it. You know, it doesn't, EMPs don't keep me awake at night. I'm, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you do the best you can and leave the rest in God's hands. That's, That's right. our theory. That's do the right. best you can and leave what you can, if there's things that you can never 
be fully prepared for. And so leave the rest in God's hands. That's right. Just do your part. Do what you can. Well, we hope you have a great rest of your week. Yes. And we'll look forward to visiting with you next week. And thank you so much for listening. That's right. See (laughs) y'all. Bye. Thank you.